Coming up on DTNS, the U.S. brings antitrust charges against Google, Adobe's new AI features for Photoshop and more, and why social media is making people angrier at each other. Ah. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And this is Allison Sheridan of the Podfeed Podcasts. And I'm the show's producer, Lost in Time. Right. <laughs> That's Roger Chang. Uh, we were just talking about uh, plurals and 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 the definitions of folk and y'all and proper gendered pronouns. Uh, if you want to get our thoughts on that, get Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google confirmed it's discontinuing the Nest Guard home security system. The product was initially released in 2017. Google says existing Nest Guard systems, however, will continue to function as normal. I'm just wondering if you have a text expander snippet that says, Google has discontinued, so you don't have to keep writing it. All right, Microsoft began pushing out its Windows 10 October 2020 update. It includes a refreshed start menu with a transparent background to tiles, the addition of Edge browser tabs to Alt tab, and the ability to set monitor refresh rates in the Windows 10 settings panel. This is also the update that officially bundles in the Chromium-based version of Microsoft's Edge browser. Intel agreed to sell its NAND flash business to SK Hynix for $9 billion in an all-cash deal, including its solid-state drive business, NAND component, and wafer operation, as well as its factory in Dalian, China. Uh, if you were listening to Good Day Internet yesterday, you already know this. Intel will keep its Optane memory business developed in partnership with Micron. The deal will make SK Hynix the second largest NAND flash provider behind Samsung. We've seen LG's rollable OLED, OLED display at CES for years, and now it's finally going on sale in South Korea. This is the 4K TV that rolls up into its aluminum base. The base can even be engraved with a personal message, too. The 65-inch LG Signature OLED R costs 100 million won, or about $87,000 U.S. I'll get mine engraved. I can't afford this. Uh, the app Stadium, that's the one that lets you stream Google Stadia on iOS by providing a multi-purpose browser app that could integrate with Bluetooth game controllers. They thought they had got past all the App Store rules, but they haven't. Apple has determined that the way the app extended WebKit to work with Bluetooth violates Rule 4.7 against exposing native platform APIs to third-party software. The app will no longer appear in the Apple App Store, but... If you've downloaded it, it will continue to work. And the developer said on Reddit he's not even mad at Apple. He's like, they just didn't like the way I extended their WebKit uh, uh, APIs. That's fine. All right, let's talk about the big news of the day. The U.S. Justice Department filed an antitrust lawsuit in Washington, D.C. federal court Tuesday, alleging Alphabet's Google engaged in anti-competitive conduct to preserve monopolies in search and search advertising. The suit alleges Google uses exclusionary and interlocking business agreements to keep out competitors. For instance, Google pays billions to make Google the default search engine on mobile phones and browsers. Google also requires its search app to be preloaded and undeletable on Android phones, and Google allegedly prohibits competitor search apps from being preloaded on phones as part of revenue sharing agreements. By dominating search, it rakes in billions on advertising, which it shares with distributors of its search products. And quoting from the filing now, these enormous payments create a strong disincentive for distributors to switch. The suit alleges Google effectively owns or controls search distribution channels, accounting for roughly 80% of the general search queries in the United States, allegedly preventing competitors from building scale, leaving consumers with fewer choices because people can't get into the market, and advertisers with less competitive prices. So the, the emphasis here, Allison, is uh, they are dominating this market so much that competitors can't get in. Remember, monopoly is not illegal on its own. It's illegal if it uh, harms the consumer. And they're alleging that the consumer is harmed because they're not getting access to innovative alternative solutions because Google is just edging everything else out of the market. So, but it's the fact that they're tying the two together that actually makes the difference that they're, it's not just that they're dominating search, it's that the dominance in search causes the dominance in advertising, which causes the dominance in search. Like they, all, they all pull the it. money together. It, it's bad that they dominate search because that keeps 
competitors out. It's bad that they dominate search advertising because that gives businesses no uh, price competition. And it's bad that they use the money from the search advertising to further reinforce their dominance in search. Okay. All right. So, so it's all of it. E each one of these is individual. In fact, one of the things I'm seeing from some lawyers out there is they don't think this filing is very strong. Uh, they think that better cases could have been made. Uh, but we'll we'll see about that in the future. Google respond uh, by arguing that it does face vigorous competition, uh, that it helps businesses reach new customers, so it's not harming its consumers. Also says the fact that most of its services are free undermines allegations of consumer harm. Senior Vice President of Global Affairs and Google Chief Legal Officer Kent Walker wrote a blog post with lots of GIFs, that's how Google always does this, uh, showing, for instance, how Bing and Yahoo are featured in Safari uh, when you choose a search uh, in featured. Safari. Featured. Oh, yeah. Featured it's when you in go, Safari. Yeah, it's when you go to a certain screen. It's not the default. You have to dig to find it. Uh, and, and they also showed how to change default search engines in Chrome saying, look, it's easy. If you want a different search engine, you can do it. Uh, and they also pointed out that Microsoft edge is preloaded on windows. Just mentioned that in windows 10 and defaults to Bing. Uh, other cases are in the works still, uh, a group of 11 state attorneys general did join the department of justice in this case. Some states may still join later, but they're still evaluating, bringing their own case largely a political decision. All the Republican attorneys general joined now. The Democratic attorney generals might be joining later. That's because of the election. A large group of states led by Texas is considering a separate case on Google's position in ad tech. Uh, that's not search advertising. That's, that's AdSense, providing advertising out in the world. And another group of attorneys general is reviewing Google's search business. That's one that could be folded into the current case, possibly, or could be on its own. Uh, again, a lot of people are thinking, this isn't a very strong case. It seems like it was rushed. I bet we could create a better case on our own. All I right. know that you, you said it was split because of uh, political reasons, and of course we'd apply that to absolutely every sentence, but I don't understand why, if the DOJ is doing it, doesn't that cover all of the states? No, the, the whether the state attorneys general want to join the case on their own is what's political. Uh, the Department of Justice brings the case federally. You're, re you're right. Right. But if you get a state attorney general to say, I also join this case, gives you a little extra firepower, right? It's not just the but U.S. federal government. it would apply government. to those states even if they the didn't join. The result will apply, yes, of course. Okay. But it's not about the result. It's about, listen, judge, it's not just us. It's also the attorney general of Texas. It's also the okay. attorney general of Montana. We're all We're all parties to this case. And also that allows the attorney general when they're running for re-election uh, to say like, look, I was I part of that. that. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Uh, if you recall, the EU also has done antitrust cases uh, against Google, uh, three of them for a total of about $9 billion in fines, as well as remedies uh, such as uh, auctions for placement on a search choice screen when you set up a new Android device. Europeans help us out. Uh, have you noticed any of these effects? Allison, I know you talked, you found a few Europeans in their natural habitat of Europe and asked them. I did some vast research on a sample set of three, uh, someone from the Netherlands, someone from Ireland, and someone from um, uh, Germany. And all three of them said, no, we haven't noticed any difference at all. Yeah. Uh, but when if you have, said, maybe there was a screen that popped up and I just absentmindedly clicked it away, but right, I don't right, remember right. seeing it. <laughs> Uh, email us, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, if you have noticed a difference. Uh, we also did this in the U.S. before. The Federal Trade Commission investigated for a year over favoring its own uh, over Google favoring its own services in search. The FTC eventually decided not to bring a case in 2013, uh, a different basis for a case than the DOJ, though. And the timeline. This will take several years. We won't be going to court for months. There will be a long court case. There will be appeals. Uh, by comparison, Microsoft's famous antitrust case around Windows took from 1998, the year Google was founded, till 2002. So call us in 2023 and we'll check in on this. We're so much more efficient now, though, Tom. I bet we'll get that done faster. Right? Get down to three years <laughs> or four. Exactly. Sure we will. Well, moving on, uh, we've got another big story here. According to the Digital 2020 October Global Slapshot Report, more than 4 billion people worldwide use social media each month, and an average of nearly 2 million new users join every day. 
That's not a big story. Research from Northwestern University political scientists show that exposing people on social media to content they disagree with makes people more polarized than if they blissfully just stayed in their echo chambers. Now, there's two kinds of this polarization. There's effective polarization, which is how much you dislike the other side. That's gotten much worse in the U.S. over the past 60 years. Now, there's also ideological polarization. How much do you disagree with the other side? Not dislike, but disagree. And that has stayed pretty much the same. So we've gotten angrier with each other, but we don't actually disagree any more than we used to. I, I, I'm just pausing for a second. I thought that was I thought that was really really interesting. That's an important thing to note, right? Is that is that it's not we're not in more disagreement. We're just mad. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right. A 2018 study led by Northwestern's Dr. Christopher Christopher Bale used data from U.S. users of Twitter and found that when you repeatedly expose people on social media to viewpoints different than their own it reinforces their own viewpoint and makes them less likely to change their mind. The results have been replicated in other studies. That's really sad. This is a psychological phenomenon that's been shown outside of this topic, which is the worst way to influence someone is to try to convince them you are right. Uh, they will just dig in. And this bears that out in, in practice, saying, yes, when you're on social media and you're exposed to a bunch of people threatening your belief, you will dig in and believe what you believe more. You will be less likely to change your mind. Now, they don't offer any ideas of how to change someone's mind, but let's keep going. In another model, David Sabin Miller and Daniel Abrams found that when we are exposed to differing viewpoints on social media, it's usually in the more extreme forms, meant to provoke an emotional reaction because that leads to heightened engagement. They found that this repulses people away from considering these different viewpoints. And that's the a model trolls use. Mr. Sabin Miller told the Wall Street Journal, a reason we have some confidence in our model is that people who are trying to polarize us are already doing what they should be by our model to be optimally effective. Yeah, this is this is worth thinking about again. Uh, in other words, it's not just that we dig in when we see opposing viewpoints. The more extreme that opposing viewpoint is, the more likely we are to dig in and like our own viewpoint more. And YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, uh, especially YouTube and Facebook, have algorithms meant to show you the most extreme version because that's engaging, because that's clickbait, because that makes you really excited to read it and share it with friends. Look at this crazy thing. Can you believe what they're doing at the party that I don't like? And that <laughs> makes people more entrenched. And I love Mr. Sabin Miller saying, hey, and we kind of think we might be right about this, not only because the math works, but also that's what people who want to disrupt a population do. They go out and they push these extreme things in front of people who disagree with them to make them angry. So could Mr. Sabin Miller please do a study on how to make people be less angry and, and understand each other's points That's of view? That's the next step. Yep. <laughs> There's probably no money in that. Anyway, many of these kinds of studies show that social media itself does not drive polarization, but rather amplifies the things that do drive it. The studies don't point to an easy solution, though banning inflammatory content and slowing down the rate at which content goes viral may or may not work. On a per personal level, though, you can look at your own feeds. Again, Mr. Sabin Miller told the Wall Street Journal, if I'm only seeing things that are good for my own side and really crazy from the other, maybe I should look for something slightly towards the center. I would like to find a source of the center. Well, okay. <laughs> Yes, uh, I know you, where you, crazy is. That's 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 a slippery slope, uh, right? But uh, the center means less crazy. <laughs> let's just let's just put it rel <laughs> relative speaking, right? If if it's seeming less crazy than what you're seeing, then it's probably moving uh, closer towards the center. But this is the here's here's some areas for further research. We're getting enough studies saying this is what seems to be causing the problem. It's not the fact that Facebook exists. It's a little bit that they push the most extreme stuff, but it's mostly how humans work and how humans react in this situation. So if you slow down retweets so that stuff doesn't go viral as fast, maybe that helps. We should study that. We should find out. Uh, if you try to ban inflammatory content, Maybe that helps, but we should study that. We should try to figure that out. That's what these scientists are saying. Like, all right, we, we're starting to nail down what the problem actually is. Now let's look at whether the solutions work and what solutions may or may not work. And I loved, again, what Sabin Miller told the Wall Street Journal is that in the meantime, you have control over what you see and who you follow. And while that isn't the solution for the world, 
it could be the solution for you if you want to put in the time to curate that and say, oh, you know what? Every time I see this person post or even this person retweet, it makes me angry. Maybe I'll stop following that person. And then you'll get less angry stuff. I think a lot of us are doing something slightly different. It's just going, you know what? Reading Twitter makes me sad. I'm going to just stop. Right? I used and to feel that bl way. People blame and Twitter rather I than who they've curated. I have approached Facebook that way, to be honest. <laughs> uh, I'm never on Facebook because of multiple reasons, but that's certainly one of them. Whereas Twitter, I put in the work and said, whenever I see someone who more than a few times in a short period of time has made me go, oh my gosh, I unfollow. And see, I, uh, my, my Facebook feed is just mostly, I'd say 95% people just being happy, showing baby pictures and some food and stuff like that. Uh, so as much as I hate Facebook as a as a concept and a and a threat, um, it doesn't get to me that way. But my yeah. my Twitter feed is definitely doom, doom scrolling. So what I've actually done to to help that is I've started following a bunch of black in hashtags. So like there's black in neuro, black in bio, black black in cam, and then a whole bunch of uh, code people. So now I'm slowly starting to shift it to where I'm seeing things about like code newbies and stuff and seeing coding yeah. stuff. Yeah, that, they, they, that you find fulfilling. And I, I would say you should prune, too. People are like, I don't want to unfollow. It seems rude. Not rude. It's protecting <laughs> yourself. Uh, and it sounds like you did with Facebook what I did with Twitter and vice versa, right? Right, right. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. We have a great crowd in there. Uh, and we get a lot of these stories that we talk about from our subreddit. So get in there, submit some stories, and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Man. Hits keep coming. Adobe announced a lot of stuff at its Max conference Tuesday. Let's talk about some of the highlights. Please hold your concerns about the future of mankind based on faked images till the end of the show, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, starting with Photoshop. Sky replacement is officially coming to Photoshop. It uses machine learning to determine what the sky is so that you can just easily swap it out and it'll adjust masks and lighting to match the new sky that you choose. Want to put a space landscape up there? You can totally do it. They demonstrated that at Max. Uh, neural filter options are coming. Neural algorithms can do things like skin smoothing or colorizing a black and white photo or smart portrait, which actually can transform a person's age. You can de-age or age people. Uh, transforms their expression, their hair, their pose. You can change where they're looking. Eight filters are shipping, six of them in beta. Uh, Adobe Skin Smoothing uses GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, to generate new pixels instead of copying and pasting, up to including things like putting in teeth to give subjects a smile. Uh, Photoshop <laughs> also can now refine hair and do some object awareness refining. Uh, this helps with hair and other things that blend into the background because of colors that are similar and textures that are similar to the background. They added a Discover panel uh, that uses machine learning to offer context-aware tools and tips. But uh, how does this? How do these some of these Photoshop features strike you, Allison? I'm thinking this is pretty awesome. Um, it, it's been a long time that I have taken portraits of people who are uh, maybe older than they wish they were, and I will go through and uh, actually using some Photoshop techniques that I learned a long time ago. I use it on other tools now, but I'll whiten their teeth, maybe soften the wrinkles, but keep the sharpness around the eyes. And they think I take spectacular photos. Okay. Now, I'm not going in and putting a smile where there wasn't one, but I have been known to, you know, open one person's eyes when there were 12 people in the photo and one person looked bad, but go get their eyes from another photo. So it all, I guess it all has to do with whether you do this for good or for evil. But uh, I, I'm, the thing I'd really like the most is the sky. I think that would be really fun to be able to mess around with the sky and then not have to spend hours trying to figure out how to change the the lighting of the rest of the photo to go with the sky you just put in because that's where it always looks like garbage when i'm done yeah and of course uh as i joked at the beginning here you know it does bring up the idea of like oh wait so people can just change images to mean whatever they want that's always been true this has just been an arms race the whole time photoshop just keeps getting better and better and it's getting better and better uh so they are doing something called the content authenticity initiative we've mentioned that previously on the show uh they added the beta to Photoshop in this release. So it attaches metadata supported by Behance, uh, Adobe's own social network for photos. The metadata it'll track are the thumbnail, the creator's name, 
broad types of edits done to the photo and original assets, and that's cryptographically protected. So if it's there, you can tell, oh, this person created it. This is what the thumbnail should look like. This is what they did to it. So I know, oh, they changed the sky. That'll be in there, stuff like that. So Barb Bouchot talked in his Let's Talk Photography podcast one time about, we get all up in arms about, well, then it's not a real photo. You've modified it. And he said, you know, Ansel Adams, when he created some of his most spectacular photos, he did not have the dynamic range capability in his film at the time to create some of the images you see. What they would do back then is cover up the sky during the first part of the exposure and then remove that physical piece of cardboard or whatever in order to expose the rest of the uh, the sky for the rest of the film uh, you know, absorption at that point. So from as far back as photography has been done, we've been modifying what we could actually capture uh, you know, natively. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Photos are never what real life looks like. This is right. all about what you want to modify. Do you want to modify it to look more like real life or less like real life? My uh, iPhone takes way cool. better pictures of the sunset than they look in real life. Lots of times I go, wow, that's <laughs> awesome. And I go, oh, it's not that good. In the real sun life. doesn't look that good. <laughs> Uh, have you ever seen the sun in, re in person? Man, it looks horrible. It's all shopped. Uh, we got some other uh, things that, that Adobe announced here to, that we could mention. Premiere Pro uh, now has automatic speech-to-text caption generation in 12 languages, including translation. Uh, so fantastic. I'm not sure how good it works. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure it works fine. Uh, but yeah, that would that'd be cool to not only be able to do auto-generated captions for accessibility, but but even for translation to say like, oh, let's let's turn this into Spanish. Uh, so we got Spanish captions. I would use this for turning Korean to English for myself. Uh, character animator now automatically animates a character based on speech. So you do the voice track, you put the character in, and it'll do head and eyebrow movements and all that sort of stuff. That's back to us being doomed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's animated, though. How are we doomed? Okay. Just friendly cartoon characters, Allison. Okay, sure. That's all it'll be used for. That's all it'll be used for. Uh, Illustrator for the iPad is now out, uh, and you can move your projects back and forth between the iPad and the Mac version. Uh, Lightroom has added advanced color grading tools, uh, similar to the tools you have in Premiere uh, for video, offers separate controls for tweaking colors in an image's highlights, midtones, and shadows. Uh, Adobe Fresco is now available for the iPhone. This is a digital drawing and painting app, uh, and the iPhone version has the same functions as the iPad version, uh, although they did improve some of the controls to be a little more touch forward, and you can sync your project across both devices as well. And I thought that I immediately thought of you when I saw this one, Allison. Live streaming now built into the iPad version of Photoshop and Illustrator. So you can show your screen and a small inset of yourself from the iPad's camera or a camera that you have attached. Uh, they only will stream to Behance, again, Adobe's own photo social network for now, uh, but they didn't rule out that they would add capabilities to stream elsewhere in the future. That's interesting. So they're probably using the screen recording feature built into iOS in order to build that stream. I would think that's the way Loom does it. You can do mm -hmm. tutorials direct to the internet on Loom. Uh, but uh, that's pretty cool. And they Behance has had the ability to do lots of streaming from apps before, but you had to use another piece of software to do it. Uh, this is in Photoshop. So, yeah, if you're somebody who even knows what Loom is, maybe this isn't for you because it's not going to give you all the control. But if you've been like, ah, I'd love to live stream, it's just too complicated. Well, now you'll just have a button there, right? You just hit that button and and live stream. Granted, only on Behance for now, but maybe they'll add Twitch in the future or, or YouTube or, or something like that. Um, anyway, there's there's lots more out of Max. They announced a, a lot, but I, I felt like that was some of the highlights. Yeah, that's really getting to be fun. Well, our last story here is iMore points out that YouTuber Zolatech has a video showing Apple's MagSafe charger working with a Pixel 5. Apple says the charger only works with the iPhone 12 and iPhone 12 Pro. And Android Police says uh, reports that it works with the Galaxy Z Fold 2 as well. And I, I went and watched this video, and it's kind of interesting because it's not just that it it worked as a Qi charger; it's actually sticking to the phones. Yeah. And um, and I I gotta say, uh, Zolotech says at one point, oh, it's sticking to the aluminum, and it, it you need iron in order for a magnet to stick. So that's not why it's sticking. It's got to be sticking to something else. Uh, inside the uh, inside the phone itself, because magnets don't stick to aluminum. So we, in our production meeting, had suspected that maybe it was the coil uh, that it was sticking to. But you were saying 
the magnetic coil isn't in all the models of iPhone that the video was able to attach that thing to. Right. In in all of the examples where he showed it sticking, like he sticks it to an iPhone 8 and an iPhone 11, and it the magnet sticks the the magnetic coil sticks to it. And so uh, I, I, of course, referred back to Halliday and Resnick uh, physics into the uh, Maxwell's equations, uh, checked into that to make sure I was uh, at least close on this. But I don't believe that the the one thing we were wondering was whether the induction coil itself uh, for the uh, for the charging could be causing enough of a current or uh, enough magnetic field for it to be able to hold on to that magnet. And it's, it's not going to do that because it's an oscillating coil. So it's just, it's kind of flipping polarization or something along those lines. I may be fudging them my exact facts there, but I don't think that's it. There's gotta be other iron based things in those phones that it's sticking to something in the frame somewhere. But it is the coil, the way Apple described it in their announcement, it is the coil in the iPhone 12 that it's connecting. Yes. To, right. Yeah, so the iPhone 12 does have an um, that's magnetic. It's not just electromagnetic. It's it's actually got it's a magnetic. It's got it's okay. got a bunch of little bar magnets and in, in kind of a and, uh, it's not a not a full circle but almost a full circle. So they're in there it actually does have uh, a magnet in it. So I'm not exactly sure what it's sticking to in those other phones, but it's sticking to something with iron in it is all I could say for sure. All right. Uh let's finish up by checking out the mailbag. Why, Tom, I am glad that you asked. We have an email from Nick. It says, hi, Tom. Thanks for the little change of pace with David's game on today's show. I l still learned something, but it was nice to have instead of the standard discussion. Oh, well, that's nice. Thank I enjoyed you, that as well. I thought that was a lot of fun. David Spark maybe, is maybe the... Maybe uh, we'll do more games in the future. <laughs> he's the bomb. He's so fun. I loved yeah, it. Yeah, David's great. All right, keep those emails coming. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Let us know what you're thinking. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Dan Colbeck, Chris Benito, and Carmine Bailey. And thank you, Allison Sheridan, uh, for joining us. What do you got going on these days? Well, I think of my favorite blog post going on right now is I put one up called Your Zoom Drinking Parties Need an Agenda. And I talked through how I, I got my friends to follow an agenda so that we never talk about COVID when we get together and have drinks once a week. So we know that that's a, a full hour where nobody's going to talk about it. And it's the agenda that makes it happen. And I give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to make that happen for your Zoom drinking parties. Excellent. Hey, folks, would you like a DTNS hat, hoodie, mask, or mouse pad? We have all that and more at the DTNS store, dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. The Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>